Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and uh, I'm, I'm stalling. I'm stalling. I I have a pattern when I pre prepare every Indiegogo campaign. It gets done at the last minute. Um, uh, so anyway, um, over the last day or so, I've been uh, getting my way through this like hour and a half interview with uh, Howard Chaikin on Cartoonist Cafe. But it's a great uh, uh, interview. Uh, very lively and fun. I thought it was very interesting. But one of my favorite parts is actually uh, coming towards the end. And uh, so I've always kind of um, made fun of the, you know, uh, the pathetic need to uh, turn every comic into a Netflix pitch. Um, and I talked about, you know, people say, well, you know, what's the problem? Isn't there more money in Hollywood? Or like, not in the way people think. Uh, people think it's some sort of uh, lottery for nerds, you know. Um, but all I've seen the whole time I've been collecting comics is people make a big deal about, oh, I want to get a movie, a TV, uh, oh, I'm going to do this and that, and they always come back to comics. Um, Frank Miller, Grant Morrison, Neil Gaiman, Howard Chaikin. Howard Chaikin had probably the most planned and interestingly successful. Um, but... A lot of this is just, you know, supposition on my part until I read an interview or I watch one and someone says very plainly what happened. So uh, Howard chaikin has been in the industry since he was like, I don't know, 18 or 19. Uh, he came up through the 70s. Uh, he actually illustrated the first Star Wars um, uh, comic of, you know, adaptation of the uh first movie from 1977 and this was before when it was just like eh, sci-fi they do okay all they had is a script i think they had a couple of publicity photos that's why job of the hut looks like a walrus um uh but um he ended up he, he told a, a great story about being uh i believe like uh, uh 34 33 34 he had been in the industry you know 14 years had some real solid success um and then he realized he basically had nothing, you know, like he could pay his bills, you know, and, but um, he had no savings. And he said something that was really great. He said, I needed to go out to Hollywood. And he also does a story where he just says he got really cold. <laughs> I, I don't know how you get to the age of 34 living in New York City and getting sick of the cold. I got sick of the cold after like being there for like six months. I, the, my first winter there. I lived there briefly in the early 90s, but it was just for a couple months and it was in the summer. I really like, I know some people don't like New York City during the summertime. I love it. Um, uh, but, you know, I moved there during the summer and then as, you know, it was getting cooler, I was like, oh, you know, the, the fall is so beautiful. And then when it was, you know, Christmas time, I go, you know, the lights on the trees and all the natives are like, you don't understand what you're getting into. Yeah, it's nice. It just started. We have like five or six more months of this. Sometimes it will snow in April. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I moved out in like February. And even like the second week in January just got grim. You're like, oh, so this is this is my life. I have like four more months of being cold all the time. But anyway, uh, he, he talked about growing up uh, very poor. Um, and I forget exactly how he stated it. I believe he's, he's like a, I think he said he's a, either a communist or he has, you know, he, he, some things about that he believes in, but he also said something great. He basically said, you know, I realized I was going to become a burden on society. So I had to do something to change that. So he left to Hollywood. Um, and now it took a couple years for him to really get like steady work. But once the nineties came around, he worked steadily until I think he said uh, 2002. Um, so he had about 13 years. And what's interesting about that is, you know, 13 years, that's a good long time, especially if you're in a good union. And actually, Hollywood is one of the few industries, well, not, not few, but one of the industries where I actually do believe that unions are good and they serve a purpose. And it's because of the, the nature of the their, it's high skill, but then it's, it's short contracts, so they do need they do need unions, or they they would get those short contracts, you know, used against them, so they wouldn't make uh, you know enough to even pay for an apartment. Um, uh, but so at the end, he's talking about his books. He goes, you know, I've always been an acquired taste. My stuff's never sold well. 
Um, but then he mentions he lives five houses away from the beach. Um, I mean, he did. I think I think he mentioned the city. I'm not gonna you know say it, but he. I think he said that two or three times. He goes, it's it's five houses down to the beach, uh, for me. Which if you be t- okay, so <laughs> just being a little bit cynical, I was like. If he's talking about those, you know, uh, those rows where it's like a street, it turns, there's one house. That could be five block. It's a short walk to the to the ocean, which is, you know, a dream to most people. Um, and comics, being a comic book legend, did not do that. What did it was writing for Flash. And what was the one where the guy was in a wheelchair, but he had a bodysuit? Mantis. And... Mutant X and everything that was like shitty, low budget and kind of comic related, Howard Chaykin got hired for, you know, for 13, you know, 14 years. Um, uh, so I really like the idea of um, uh, the responsibility of that. You know, like I said, you know, he's, he's a lifelong, uh, I think he's a Democrat by default. He would be a communist if I, I used to read a million interviews from. So I, I think I remember that reading that type of stuff. Um, but, uh, the responsibility of it, of, you know, I love comics. I'm great at comics. I'm a comics legend. I'm in my mid thirties. I have no savings. I've got to do something about it. And he did it the smart way. He didn't play the lottery. He worked at the convenience store that sells the lottery tickets. It's a huge difference. It's a complete, uh, don't screw this up. 180. (laughs) I almost said 360. And then I remember that, that bit from uh, last action area. It's a complete 180. They, you know, they see Hollywood as a lottery. He saw it as a stable business. I talked in a video earlier about how many of the people, you know, you love from uh, the, you know, the 90s and where did they go? Uh, you know, it's uh, Stephen Platt. It's, um, uh, I'm blanking on every single name of everything. Richard Bennett, uh, uh, Dan Frega did this. They all go to storyboarding because, you know, it's their skill set. It's, you know, it's rectangular panels that tell storytelling, but it's dependable. And I really respect someone who can not make themselves a burden on society. And if you're able to do do that to the level that you can live five houses away from the beach, uh, that's a, you definitely get my respect on that. And I, and I, one of the things I like about it is the lack of selfishness of it. So, you know, one of the things I've decried is people using books as Netflix peach, uh, pitches. Um, uh, uh, Donald Delay was you know uh, telling me. He's like, oh, I just got my quarterly profit check. We're only, you know, $5,000 away from having zero profit. <laughs> I guess they're still selling the trade paperback somewhere. It's because image turned into Netflix. Let me pitch my Netflix deal. The thing is that you rope in other people. You know, they're all, oh, they're, they're, oh, oh, I got a five, uh, oh, you know, you've worked at DC and Marvel and now you're working with me. And then I'll probably like, and they, they kind of use these people and they use these companies to get these one-time deals where you know it's it's not about that it's uh, um and it's kind of very you know you know growing up during the you know the recession after world war ii and you know parents from the depression i'm assuming uh you know he he's smart and and i i love the lack of selfishness of deciding my number one goal right at the height of my artistic peak is to not be a burden on society when i'm 70. um so to that end uh if you are going to focus on Hollywood, focus on it in a smart way, uh, the Howard Chaykin way. Now, he did come back and he had this whole second phase to his career. Was it as good? Eh, and the thing is, he didn't completely leave comics during that time. Uh, he did a lot of fun stuff like, uh, I actually like his mid-90s stuff, like Power and Glory. I love Power and Glory. Um, uh, that, that was so much fun. Um, uh, but um, I really love this insight into, you know... Um, what, why you make certain career choices. And uh, he, he, he effectively says that he uses a lot of, um, it's funny, he starts talking about how Gil Kane, he was assistant to Gil Kane. He says, the math never made sense. The guy was always, you know, paycheck to paycheck, but he was hiring all these people to get more work, but he had to hire more people. And then later he was stealing original art to sell it. To, and I think he saw that roller coaster of a Gil Kane who was probably, you know, in his 30s at that time. Uh, I'm probably closer to 40 or so uh, and saying, I don't want to get on that. And so that's, it's, um, it's kind of, I, I would say it kind of like, it's the highest level of maturity to see other people making mistakes. It's going to make them a burden and say, I'm not going to be that guy. I'm going to, you know, go, you know, uh, 
cement my future and then when everything's solid there's a point you know if, if you know anything about retirement planning there's a point where you can you know do the math and there's a lot of really good apps that will tell you you know you know you're this much of a shortfall versus your social security and what you need to survive in you know 20 years 40 years whenever you're retiring so I was I really respected that and he's he's a uh, I don't know if they call, a board member I think it's called on Hero Initiative which basically and he was very blunt. He said, Hero Initiative is a charity for people who don't plan. Um, and uh, so it really impresses me when do, people do plan and then they're able to take care of the people uh, who don't. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe. Make sure you're still subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. Uh, 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 thanks to everyone giving to the... Uh, oh, to explain my, um, to, to explain my uh, uh, title, I think I'm going to have that, you know, Selling out is the uh, the highest form of charity. Um, uh, I, I've given to charities before. I've done it. I gave to the Hero Initiative. I gave to the Trevor Project. Uh, and then when this current, you know, these trying times, I remembered my time and I did a little research and I just decided to give money directly. No, you don't get to deduct it as a charity with your taxes. But I know that 100% of, you know, I've been reading charity, you know, horror stories for, you know, since I was a teen. And in my mind, a charity should survive off of less than 25% of what they take in. I know there, I know some people have said, oh, you know, as long as they don't take more than 50%, that's actually, you know, pretty good. That's pretty standard. Uh, I would rather just give it directly. But the, the greatest charity is to not be a burden on others. So, um, uh, quote unquote, selling out is, you know, the greatest charity you can provide to uh, uh, society because you're not going to be one of those people who's a burden. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.